and go. Hello, UK Talks Webinar Series 2탄 그세 번째 세션에 참석해 주셔서 감사합니다. 저는 주한 연구문화원 교육사회실 소속 엄선현입니다. 팬데믹에도 불구하고 양질의 교육과 커리어 개발에 대한 열정은 좀처럼 식지 않는데요. 작년 12월에 진행했던 UK Talks 웨비너 시리즈 학부 편에는 400명이 넘는 분들이 등록해 주셨어요. 그래서 이번에는 석박사 유학 그리고 커리어 개발을 주제로 총 11개의 웨비너를 준비하였습니다. 이번에도 300명에 가까운 분들이 기꺼이 귀한 시간을 내어주신 만큼 유익한 시간이 되기를 바라며 세 번째 세션 시작하겠습니다. 이번 세션에서는 정치학 전공에 대하여 높은 경쟁력을 지닌 영국의 유수대학교 세곳 교수님들과 함께 코로나 시대의 세계 정세와 향후 전망을 세 가지 관점에서 이야기 나눠볼 예정인데요. 엑서터 대학교의 로즈 올리버 제임스, 아 죄송해요. 엑세터 대학교의 올리버 제임스 교수님, 골드스미스 런던 대학교의 사힐 두타 교수님, 그리고 에식스 대학교의 로버트 존스 교수님께서 각각 15분씩 준비한 발표를 해주실 거예요. 그에 앞서 간단한 당부의 말씀 드리겠습니다. 본 웨비나는 약 1시간 동안 영어로 진행될 예정이에요. 연사분들이나 참여 대학에 관해 궁금한 점이 있다면 언제든지 채팅창에 질문 부탁드리겠습니다. 지금 백스테이지에 대기 중인 각 대학의 담당관들이 정성껏 답변 드릴 거예요. 채팅창은 컴퓨터로 접속하신 분들은 우측에서 확인하실 수 있고 모바일 기기로 접속하신 경우에는 상단에 물음표 아이콘 누르시면 채팅창이 나옵니다. 채팅창에서 공감 가는 질문이나 마음에 드는 답변이 있다면 좋아요 버튼 눌러주세요. 발표 종료 후 질의응답 시간에 좋아요가 높은 질문 위주로 답변을 부탁드릴 예정입니다. 웨비나 종료 전에 랜덤으로 한 분께 약소하지만 선물을 드릴 예정이니 끝까지 자리를 지켜주시면 감사하겠습니다. 그럼 지금부터 시작하겠습니다. Hi speakers, thank you so much for waiting for our opening in Korean. We are now ready to start our first presentation. So everyone, I'm honored to introduce the first speaker, Professor Oliver James from the University of Exeter. He will speak from a political and international relations perspective. Dr. James? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to uh, talk with you this morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, Very well. excellent. And I'm to talk for 15 minutes, is that correct? Yes, right. Right, great. Okay, well, I'm very pleased to um, have the opportunity to talk with you this morning. Um, and what we're going to do is talk to you uh, about the, um, I'm just wondering whether I, I um, control the slides or do you? Uh, you can just tell me next slide or next, then I will click it for you. Right, great. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about the perspective that uh, politics and international relations can offer in, to understanding some of the key challenges that are presented by the current global COVID-19 perspective, and also talk specifically about how researchers in the Department of Politics at the University of Exeter have developed understanding uh, that's useful for tackling the global pandemic. So we can have the next slide, please. So this morning I'm talking to you live from Exeter, which is in the southwest of England. And here are some of the, the, the sort of pictures of where we're uh, located. Uh, and it's a sort of spring day here and uh, you know, very, uh, uh, sort of, uh, very sort of pleasant part of the country. Uh, and I'm pleased to be able to talk to you this morning. So if we move on uh, to the next slide, please. So there are valuable insights to be gained from understanding uh, the processes of uh, politics and the policy uh, development and outcomes that are related to those when it comes to uh, tackling COVID. And what I'm going to do is just make some points in general, but then specifically say how some of the researchers at Exeter have been investigating this, uh, this phenomenon. So the global pandemic um, shows really the importance of how politics and medical um, knowledge are combined in order to develop policy to tackle this, uh, this recent um, uh, crisis. And also understanding different countries' political systems can understand, help you to understand why the uh, approach has differed in different uh, country contexts. 
So, for example, if you look at the, the, uh, the approach adopted in South Korea, which has been relatively highly successful in tackling uh, COVID um, compared to many other countries, that was clearly influenced by partly its experience with other earlier pandemics like uh, the SARS um, and MERS. Um, well, they weren't pandemics, they were um, earlier health emergencies in SARS and, and MERS and the South Korean system of ha having set up something, uh, a center for communicable disease control, enabled it to process the new threat uh, more effectively than many other um, countries. Understanding international relations is also crucial for understanding how the global community can respond to the pandemic and international organizations are central to uh, both coordination of nation states uh, responses but also international coordinated responses for addressing the pandemic. And of course, organization like the World um, Health Organization uh, is an important uh, part of uh, uh, that, uh, that response. So we can have the next slide, please. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you some insights into some research that's been going on at Exeter, uh, which helps us understand um, some of the some of the political features of um, the uh, global challenge. So in common with any other sort of global challenges like uh, climate change being another one, uh, many of these factors are not just a scientific um, problem uh, or even a technological problem. They are a political problem because there's a need for political communities, both at the nation state level, but also at many other levels, local level, uh, international level to come together in order to solve those uh, uh, problems to address those uh, challenges. So if you understand, for example, how uh, political factors and medical science advice are combined in political systems that is valuable for uh, for understanding how uh, the politics of the pandemic operate but also how solutions can be uh, derived so this is based on some um, teaching materials that we've been talking to the students at exeter about uh, this year and shows how in the uk national governmental system the political aspects of the crisis are coordinated by the Cabinet Office. There's a, a, a committee called COBRA, uh, and that stands for actually um, Cabinet Office Business Rooms, which is the, the rooms where the politicians and the, the scientific advisors come together in order to shape the policy. And that policy is informed by the government's chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer who draw on a panel called SAGE, now, SAGE is an English word meaning wise, but it's also an abbreviation uh, for scientific advisory um, uh, group. And so the challenge is to combine this expert advice, this expert opinion, medical advice with the uh, political realities of the situation. And understanding politics is crucial to understanding how politicians take advice from scientists and then combine it with what they see as politically possible in order to develop a policy to tackle the pandemic. So initially, the UK was perhaps uh, relatively slow to, uh, to shut down the, uh, the economy and society in the first wave, but subsequently uh, has caught up. And indeed, if you look at the vaccination programme, uh, well over 20 million people in the UK are now vaccinated uh, against uh, the COVID uh, virus, and the number of cases is coming down uh, quite a lot. And there is a roadmap for um, freeing up people from some of the restrictions over the coming uh, the coming months. So arguably uh, it's caught up with some of the problems and is uh, now being relatively uh, more more successful, although of course time will tell uh, how that uh, how that plays out. We have the, the next slide, please. So um, first of all, as I mentioned before, you can uh, use politics and international relations to understand how governments respond, but also how people respond as well. And this is based on some research that's being done at Exeter by my colleague, Professor Susan Banducci, who's looking at crowd um, uh, and sharing of news stories about COVID. And her research there, these diagrams show, uh, the yellow uh, diagrams show the, uh, the discussion of um, the uh, COVID uh, news in the top panel at the uh, local level and the blue, the national. And you can see just from this, it's just simple descriptive data just showing how uh, you can see that COVID has uh, had huge sharing of stories about COVID uh, between individuals on their Facebook pages over time. So this, these, these, these figures show the top, the top panel shows the sharing of information about COVID um, uh, materials 
and the bottom one is, is materials about uh, Brexit, which is of course the other big political uh, change that's happening and an issue that's happening in the UK uh, in, in, in the, over the last couple of years. So by um, using uh, analysis of how people share information about COVID and how people share that relative to other stories, we can understand how the people respond to COVID because obviously if they're sharing stories about COVID, they will be concerned about it and more likely to respond to government activity and government instructions to, uh, to, to take measures in order to, uh, to try and solve the problem. But maybe uh, we can also look at their sharing of information and misinformation, incorrect information about COVID. And my colleague, uh, uh, like I said to again, Professor Jason Reifler, is looking at how uh, networks of sharing information can sometimes lead to problems of people sharing information that is incorrect. So if uh, information that's incorrect is being shared on Facebook, then that can lead people to make wrong decisions. For example, they can have wrong information about the vaccines, and so they'll be uh, less likely to take vaccines. And you have something called vaccine hesitancy uh, or even opposition to, uh, to, to vaccines if information is being shared by people that's incorrect. Now, some of these insights are being used by companies like Facebook and other organizations in order to try to reduce misinformation and even worse, disinformation, where people are deliberately trying to spread, uh, spread wrong information about COVID. So if we can look at these factors that are uh, influencing who shares information, how they share it and why, we can help address the pandemic by making sure that people get true information uh, about what they can do in order to tackle uh, the pandemic. Can I have the next slide, please. So the other thing that's uh, happening in uh, is that's important politically is whether the response to the uh, COVID situation is leading people to trust their government more or uh, to distrust their government because they don't like the way the government is dealing with the, the, um, the, the pandemic and some of the problems that the uh, pandemic is, uh, is causing. So this is some research again at Exeter that's looking at the impact of COVID on trust in government. And it is suggesting that if you look, just to take an example, the top of this panel, the top of this figure, this looks at the change in trust from people who've been personally impacted by COVID. This could mean maybe they've caught COVID or if they have no people who have, be, have been affected by it. And it shows that um, particularly in the second wave, the orange line, if you just look just at the top of this figure, um, if you've personally been affected by COVID, that does reduce uh, people's trust in their local government. Um, that dot in the middle is the, is the main point, and then the, the, the line shows the, um, the, the the degree to which um, uh, there's a, a confidence interval around that, but that clearly is in on the negative side of the um, uh, the figure. So that shows that if people are personally impacted by COVID, it does reduce their trust in their uh, local government. So clearly uh, it has political consequences. Uh, and we're researching those uh, those topics at Exeter. I have the next slide, please. So this is some research that I've done uh, with with colleagues, uh, my uh, colleague Susan uh, Banducci and, and Laszlo Horvath, and this is looking at trust in a mobile phone tracing app for contacting people if they've been a close contact of someone who has tested positive for COVID. And so what we've done is we looked at why people download this mobile phone app or not. And we found that if you tell people um, that it's a app run by the government uh, and then you tell other people it's uh, a, an app, but it's run by what we call the National Health Service, which is our health organization, people are more likely that there's an increased probability of them accepting the app if it, you tell them it's for the National Health Service compared to the government. So people trust our National Health Service to provide the app more than just saying it's the government telling you to do things. And this shows that in the UK, our National Health Service has a very strong brand. It's a very respected um, medical um, uh, facility for, for people that provides national coverage. And indeed, actually in Korea, you have some very similar um, health systems as well. Um, so you would expect perhaps uh, um, perhaps some similar insights uh, in, in, in your context that if people are told that the health service, that the doctors, are telling people it's good to, to, to download this app, then that increases their likelihood of doing that. And that's what those results in that table do. We have the, the next slide, please. So this is just, um, and I'm going to talk more about this perhaps in the Q&A afterwards. There's just a couple of slides here that are um, outlining uh, where this research is being done, which is in the politics department in, in the UK. 
um, and uh, we're embedded in a in a, um, a, a course an international network of researchers who are looking at these topics and indeed we have students from many countries including South Korea um, we have a long tradition of um, welcoming students um, to our courses and so if we just go to the next slides if we have the, the, the next slide please all I do there is just we can talk about them in more detail and I would advise you to go to the website. These are just some um, selection of our programs that look at some of these topics. So, for example, uh, our MSc in Global Governance uh, looks at some of these issues of how the World Health Organization, other international organizations can address COVID. Uh, we look at conflict and security and how those can make it more difficult, perhaps, to, to address the pandemic. Um, the next slide, please. And these are some of the career pathways um, and organizations we work with in our research. And of course, many of these are involved currently in either addressing COVID directly or in mitigating some of the consequences that people work. Uh, we work in, in terms of our research and our students then go on to work for organizations, including the National Health Service in the UK, uh, including the World Bank, international organizations and so on. And we have a lot of links with government uh, departments in the UK uh, and people take careers both in the public and private sector. And in terms of our research on COVID, that's been very useful because we've been able to draw on those relationships in order to um, find out the information we need in order to undertake the research. So I believe I'm pretty much out of time there. So I will uh, uh, finish and look forward to discussing these issues with you more. Thank you very, much, you very Oliver. much, Oliver. It was very, very insightful. insightful. Now, let me introduce the next speaker. Professor Sahil Datta. He will speak from, oh, sorry, Professor Sahil Datta from Goldsmith University of London. He will speak from a political economy perspective. Dr. Datta. Thank you, um, and thanks everyone for, for joining. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Sahil Jai Datta. I'm a lecturer in the politics department at Goldsmiths and a fellow of the Political Economy Research Center, which runs out of the politics department at Goldsmiths. And it's so nice to have this yeah, opportunity to, to, speak, to speak to you all. Um, I'm speaking from a very cold London morning. Um, Goldsmiths is based in London, and so that's where I am. And unfortunately, it's a very cold morning. Um, but what I'm going to speak to you today is about an enormous challenge that's happened to the global society over the past year, which is, of course, COVID-19, and how it helps to reflect on some of the bigger transformations that global society will face over the coming two decades. Um, next slide, please. So I convene and teach on a global political economy program at Goldsmiths, and I'll focus on political economy issues in this talk. But some of the things that I'm discussing, global politics, global society, are things that all our programmes uh, shown in this slide take up. Um, because as the world changes, so too our knowledge must change, our teaching must change, and the assumptions we have about the rules of politics, the rules of economics, and the rules of the international system, they have to change as well. Um, so next slide, please. And COVID, I think demonstrates something that's all too easily overlooked because while we focus a lot on nations and on polit particular political leaders and particular economies, in the modern world we are completely and inescapably global. A virus that starts in one place is carried quickly all around the world by people who are themselves following routes of commerce and following routes of trade. Um, and the pace in which this virus spread is very much connected to the pace of commerce and the kinds of transportation systems we have now in, in the modern economy. And why the shutting of borders feels so exceptional is because it, it breaks the really the rule that is we are global and there's no moving around that. And so global problems need to be met with global solutions. And nowhere is this clearer then with the challenge of ecological breakdown and climate change. There can be obviously no national solution to a global problem like that, to a species wide problem like that. Um, and so just as importantly as there's no sort of national solution, there's no immediate or quick fix solution policy 
um, miracle to tackling climate change. To keep within two degrees of global warming, we know is crucial. And um, that's the level at which we lose control of planetary feedback loops and uh, which global heating accelerates very rapidly. So for global society to function as we know it, we need to keep within that 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 limit. Um, and to do so, to stay within that range, the UN says will require, and I've got this quote here, fundamental system wide reorganization across technological, economic and social factors, including paradigms, goals and values. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying a great transformation, a complete change in how we organize technology, how we organize economies, how we organize society, and in what we place value in, how and why. And so in policy form, this would mean a significant investment into a new energy system, away from fossil fuels and to renewables. And this is something that will happening, happen and is happening. But to do this work properly, it can't be done by kind of one entity. It will require public investment, private investment, but also a kind of global coordination, a global planning that can see solar and hydropower and less oil-based fertilizers and food systems and all that kind of things. And this program is known as a Green New Deal. Um, that's how it's sort of termed by policymakers and by social movements. But according to the UN again, a global Green New Deal would require an investment of $1.7 trillion a year. And that sounds unthinkable, right? Next slide, please. It certainly does feel unthinkable, but I think the last year has demonstrated how unthinkable things become very normal very quickly. Um, thinking in planetary scales, in April of last year, 80% of the gl entire global workforce was under one kind of restriction or another, like a lockdown. Um, and that's a planetary wide coordination to try and solve a planetary wide problem. Um, and yes, it's been you know, very tough and at times very boring, um, but it's also something that would have been completely unthinkable a year before then. And so alongside this radical reorganization of the workforce that we've had this year, um, there's been an unprecedented response by governments to try and protect, secure the economy, find the kind of vaccines um, and, and, and protect from the fallout of COVID-19. Uh, and if you add up the various um, spending programs and tax changes and the kind of employment support and the bank bailouts globally, there's been a nine trillion dollar commitment by governments to meet the COVID-19 challenge. And so suddenly when you compare nine trillion in one year to that global Green New Deal um, figure that I gave on the last slide, the challenge doesn't seem so impossible after all. And what I think this tells us is that however big our challenges might be, they are not, you know, impossible. Um, things that are now totally inevitable, um, you know, whether it's economic growth or consumerism or whatever, are always political. These things have come from political places and there's always political solutions to this. And so, next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, that picture looks quite, quite little, but hopefully I can talk you through some of it. Um, to just give a sense of how yeah, how political these these changes in, in global society are. We think that environmental damage is as old as the Industrial Revolution itself. Or sometimes we think that, you know, our, this stuff is just tied to human beings and we've always looked to go and consume more. We've always burnt things to try and, um, you know, improve, improve ourselves and improve society and improve our material conditions. And um, so that gives the impression that environmental change and economic change that goes with it is as old as time itself and it's very difficult to confront it. But if you look at some of the graphs here, it's actually an enormous takeoff since 1950. The global population, our water use, economic growth, the loss of uh, species and biodiversity, the number of floods we've had, and then most importantly, perhaps, the carbon dioxide emissions. All of this has taken off 
in the second half of the 20th century after the Second World War. And this period is known in sort of um, yeah, in environmental science and in, in, in political economy circles as the Great Acceleration. And it's something this period matches onto um, and is tied up within the historical timescale of the dominance of the United States as the leading military, political, technological and economic power. Um, so very much the story of the 20th century. Um, so the global economy got rooted around first American production and American goods that we've all around the world, you know, come to consume and things that are the household names that we, you know, we all enjoy so much. Um, things like Coca-Cola, things like McDonald's, these things like Boeing, um, the aircraft manufacturer, all of this comes out of a United States experience. And then later in the 20th century, America became the, became the key consumer of products and raw materials made in the rest of the world, especially products made uh, by producers in East Asia, which is why now brands like Samsung and LG have become household names in the West. So what the Great Acceleration tells us is that global ecological kind of change and breakdown is very recent and it's tied to a very particular kind of global economy that was rooted around America and fossil fuels in the 20th century. Next slide, please. And another key feature um, of the Great Acceleration and reflecting that importance of America to global society is the dominance of the US dollar to global society. The US dollar is a global currency. If you're buying and selling things on international markets, you do that in dollars. So if you're Germany buying copper from Australia, you buy it in dollars. If you're Samsung buying Colton from the Democratic Republic of Congo to build mobile phones, you do that in dollars. If you're a Qatari oil shake and you want to keep your millions safely, you invest in dollar based financial assets. Um, so 80 percent of all transactions internationally take place in dollars and the global financial system is organized and ordered in US dollars, which means that whenever there's a problem to the financial system, like in the 2008 financial crisis and indeed the recent um, in, in March, in uh, last March in with the COVID crisis, the world is dependent on dollars and quickly the US has to come and bail them out. And that's exactly what happened in 2008 when like many countries around the world, South Korea needed a $30 billion bailout by the US Central Bank, the, the Federal Reserve. And so I say this because when we're thinking about systemic change, like the UN said, this will involve a leadership role by the United States because of the way we all use the dollar, the US government has enormous capacity to help lead the financing of that global Green New Deal that I was mentioning. Okay, next slide, please. In a globalized economy, though, there are many other players. Um, and when we look into who is investing into renewable energy at the moment, it's very striking because China, while it is emitting 28% of all global um, carbon emissions, is also investing more into renewables than Europe and the US put together. And that is very important because unlike many other lines of technology where China still has to import from the rest of the world because it doesn't have that technology domestically, in green tech, um, these are you know wholly homegrown Chinese companies and Chinese industries um, and it's recognizing, and this is part of the, the contemporary ch Chinese leadership is trying to recognize that it sees renewable energy technology as a huge asset in building towards a, you know, a global and, and, and globally dominant role in the 21st century. And so if the rest of the world, you know, doesn't step up and match this scale of ambition, what we may see is a new tension, and we're seeing this absolutely at the moment, over the global hegemonic role in the international system. Who is going to be the leader of the international system? Um, and will there be a transfer away from the US, which is this tech leader and is the dollar leader, which I was mentioning before, and had been over the 20th century, to China, which is now building these, um, yeah, these new technologies. And perhaps the New Deal in America laid the foundation for the Great Acceleration. Maybe a Green New Deal, if led by China, will lead to 
yeah, a different form of international system. And so when we're rebuilding after COVID, um, this is something that is a new contemporary challenge that we must confront. Next slide, please, and I'll finish with this. And so in doing a great transformation, um, it remains open to see in what direction we'll go. Um, it really does depend on how much we mobilise global society and where we choose to, to, to invest and how. And what I've tried to do in this talk is show that questions of economy, of ecology, of politics and international relations can't be separated out from one another. In the real world, there's not you know, a separate dis academic disciplines. The world doesn't divide itself up into politics and economics and international relations. And so the way we teach and the way we learn needs to catch up with that. Global political economy is, a, I find it very exciting, precisely because it is holistic, it's interdisciplinary, um, and certainly in what we in what and how we teach at Goldsmiths, these kinds of uh, questions of, of climate change, of the energy system, of the financial system, need to be taken together and see how they shape the politics of global society and how, as we transition to a new energy system, who will be empowered and who will be marginalised and what are the kind of fault lines that we collectively need to reflect upon. Um, so that's the kind of the kind of spirit and the kind of programmes we have. Uh, and hopefully there'll be some questions um, that I can help answer with. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tahil. It was very sharp. I think it will be very useful for the attendees. Cool. Thank you. So now we have our last speaker, Robert Jones from University of Essex. So he will speak from a political and data science perspective. Dr. Jones. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's early in uh, the UK, um, but it was even earlier for the other speakers. So in a way, I got the, uh, the good deal here. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Government at the University of Essex. Obviously, my talk is about the, the need for data science and political science to go hand in hand. There will be quite a few echoes of Professor James from Exeter's talk because he was talking about some of the political science that I will be talking about being informed by data science. And my aim really is to persuade you that this is the cutting edge of studying politics. But just as political science can't ignore the huge amount of data around the place. The key point is that data science can't ignore um, the political implications and the political context in which all of this is happening. Um, the University of Essex, if put in, in South Korean terms, is more kind of a, a pohang than a Seoul national. That is, this is, um, it's a relatively young university and it's a university whose, in particular, whose politics has always been at the kind of science and technology end. It's a quite a quantitative um, department. Um, you know, we've in, Brit in Britain, a lot of people don't really like the phrase political science. They talk about political studies or politics, um, whereas Essex has always embraced the science, um, which makes it loved by some people and not so loved by others. Um, but it makes it a very good place. Um, from which to, to think about where data science might come in, because we've always been kind of moving in that direction. Um, so the, the first three slides are really about how we need to go from big data to data science to political science. So if we can have the, the next slide, which is just to um, remind you that there is this um, kind of deluge of, of data. So can we go next slide, please? Yeah, this is just a reminder that there is, it used to, they used to call it an information explosion. Now some people call it a data deluge. Um, and it's not just that there is now unprecedented power to store, retrieve and analyze all the traditional kind of numeric data. Um, it's also that things like text, images, even moving images can now be digitized, translated into data in that way. So basically we know an unprecedented amount about where you're going, what you're doing, who you're doing it with, and even maybe how you're feeling while you're, you're doing it. And all of this has political implications potentially. And the quote that's often used in these contexts is that data is the new oil. 
And this is a version of oil that's not going to run out. It's probably going to just keep flowing in ever greater quantities. Now, like oil, the crude unrefined version is not very useful. We need to do something with this oil. And so on the next slide, on the next slide, please, um, that's about data science or sometimes known as data analytics. The, one of the quotes continues, if data is the new oil, then data science is the combustion engine. And that really just reflects the fact that, you know, it's possible, for example, to download millions of posts on Facebook or millions of tweets, but it's just a giant mountain or mess unless you have some ways of making sense of, of those. With numerical data, it's always been fairly easy to turn these things into, into graphs like the one on the left. Um, with textual data, you need to do something else, but it's not difficult to create just a simple word cloud. Um, and it's not that difficult to do other things. The graph shows you not just how many words are used, but which words about the COVID outbreak were more likely to be used in the US by Republican politicians and which by Democratic politicians, for example. And there's even ways through sentiment analysis to measure um, whether which of the emotions seem to be shown in the in politicians or for that matter, um, the public's tweets about something like COVID. So we get a sense of whether people are really afraid or whether they're more angry um, or more sad or, or whatever it might be. Now, in a way, this all looks seriously scientific and it involves machine learning and algorithms and all sorts of predictive modeling and lots of stuff that we would recognize as very scientific, but it's not really science as we need it in the political world. Um, partly because it's just kind of description. It's the, the kind of stuff you see on this slide is quite good at answering questions like what's happening and how much is being done, but it's not as good at addressing the questions like why and how is this kind of stuff happening. Um, and then of course, there's the fact that Politics isn't a hard science. Numbers aren't just numbers. Words aren't just words. They mean something and they represent complicated underlying things. And those meanings depend on context and interpretation. Uh, two politicians can use exactly the same word with the same frequency, but what they um, mean and what people understand by those is um, to, to grasp that needs more than just a computer. It needs a, a human brain, a human brain like yours. Uh, those of you watching this, you would be bringing that political understanding. Um, so that takes us to the next slide, which is about moving from data science to political science. Um, you know, we want to know, for example, why is it that Republican and Democratic politicians talk about COVID in a different way? Is it because they think their voters want to hear different things? Or is it something more in this context where people where the um, the mass public doesn't really know what's going on is it a case actually that the politicians talk in different ways and then voters just follow their politicians lead and if you combine data science with political science you can for example make a time trend and see well how are the politicians talking about this how were the media talking about this and then you can combine this with opinion polls to see which directions the public moved. And you can get an, un, an unusually clear sense of who's persuading who, who's moving who, who's following and who's leading in this kind of context. That's what political science can, can add. And then there are interesting questions about why we would see different parties and different parties voters taking different stands on, on COVID-19. Um, is it an ideological thing where more conservative or right wing people don't like the big state solutions that a pandemic often involves? But then there's a political psychology angle to this, because it always used to be said that conservatives, people who are more um, cautious, are also more afraid and so should be likely to react more strongly to a pandemic. Um, whereas what we've seen doesn't seem to, to bear that out. The key point is that um, big data has a lot to say about the political world, but you need political science to translate that. You need data science and political science to translate that into something meaningful. And in what remains of the presentation, I'm really just going to provide three examples of research areas where data science and political science have come together 
um, to improve our, our understanding of, of our world. Um, so the next slide shows the first example. And it's about something that, that Oliver James has already alluded to, alluded to which is this, um, the fact that there's a lot of nonsense out there, a lot of completely inaccurate information about um, the pandemic, um, about the causes of it, about how to treat it, and about the, more recently, about the, the vaccines. Um, data science has confirmed to us that there's a lot of this about. There is a lot of disinformation and misinformation and that it is widely shared. And this has led people to a bit of a panic that you know, huge uh, proportions of the population believe nonsense and that they are busy by sharing their persuading other people. Now, this is a classic case where political science actually gives us a more restrained and actually a more, a more optimistic view of the world. Partly because we've always known in terms of politics and the media that it's not true that people just believe what they read. We all approach what we read with our previous attitudes and often with a certain scepticism. Um, and there's this famous thing, the third person effect, where you, know, you, you look at me and you think, if I said to you, do you think I'm influenced by misinformation that I've read about COVID? And my guess is, my hope is you would say, no, I don't think you'll be influenced by it. And if I say to you, do you think you're influenced by it? You'll probably say, oh, no, we're not influenced by it. We know that it's rubbish. And then we're not really entitled to make the jump to say, oh, but everyone out there, the rest of the people, they're totally influenced by it. Actually, they're probably not influenced by it. And for the same reasons that we're not influenced by it. So we can relax a little bit about just, we can't just assume that because there's misinformation out there, people are believing it. Moreover, and this is where some, some more recent research, some of it done um, by me and colleagues at Essex comes in, is survey studies have shown that people don't necessarily believe even things that they're sharing. Lots of people share stuff that it becomes clear they don't believe at all. And there are various reasons why they do this. The most obvious is that if they think that something is supporting their party or opposing a political party they dislike, then they will share it regardless of whether they think it's true. Then there's the fact that disinformation and misinformation is more fun than, um, than true information. It gives people more of a buzz. And so they're more likely to share things like that in the same way that they're more likely to share news stories about um, the Harry and Meghan Markle than they are new stories about boring factual political stuff. And then there's a really weird strand of research on something called need for chaos, which is that some people score highly on this, this um, personality trait that they like to burn things down, they want to shake things up, they, they, they want to send ripples through the system. Not boring, normal, but they like the idea that, that this crazy stuff is circulating. So basically, political science has given us a much clearer idea of what's going on. And also, like I say, a more positive view uh, than you would think by just looking at all the craziness that's out there. OK, next slide, please. It looks like I'll need to accelerate slightly, so I won't spend long on this. And it, it's, that's fine because you'll, you'll all be aware of this. this idea that um, the algorithms that especially companies have set up, um, which learn by what has been happening and then attempt to reproduce that, are of course reproducing whatever biases there are in the system. The classic example of this is Amazon developed this method where people who were um, recruiting for jobs, what they wanted was a system that could automatically go through lots of people's applications and their CVs, their Vitas, and say, well, which is the best? So what they did was they gave lots of these CVs for jobs that had already been given and told the computer, well, this person got the job, but here were all the applications. You learn what the patterns, which types of people should be getting the jobs. But of course, the biases, and in particular, the gender biases that were inherent in that system means that effectively Amazon was training um, the computer to do all the same discrimination against female applicants that was happening um, in the real world. Now, data science can, a, a very naive data science, just 
does the machine learning and doesn't care about the prejudice. A more sophisticated data science spots the gender bias, um, but a really sophisticated political science approach um, not only can spot more complicated patterns of biases, but also starts to address the really difficult questions, which is things like, well, what, what can we do about this? Is it possible, for example, to insert a kind of ethical correction into an algorithm? It sounds complicated and it turns out it is. Um, either way, data science and political science need to work together on this because the, these algorithms run our lives and this, so this matters. Next slide, please. The third example also doesn't need much time because you've already been told by uh, Professor, J uh, Professor James and you'll know anyway that uh, South Korea has been wildly successful and you might also know that Britain has been pretty unsuccessful at tracking and tracing people during the pandemic and the simplest reason for that is that you, in Britain it needed the involvement of the public so I would go to somewhere and I would have to check in uh, that well, I wasn't tracked, I was just told. And um, and then I would, if I, somebody had been there who had had COVID, then I would be told, right now, can you please tell us everybody that you've met tracking me like the system in, in South Korea works? And it's not therefore difficult to see which what's going better. Um, but the problem is, well, what do we learn from that? And how do we identify what were the underlying factors? And Professor James already talked about factors like a history of dealing with viruses. Um, but then there are issues like state capacity, not just how many CCTV cameras you have, but how much you spend on health. Then there are all sorts of interesting questions about whether authoritarian regimes are better at dealing with this, or countries with female leaders uh, seem to be better at dealing with the pandemic. And there are deeper questions about political culture and trust. So um, it's another case where political science and data science needs to work together. And that leads to my final slide, which is just an alert about the kind of degrees that I would recommend you do. And this is really important because one of the great things about data science and political science is that you can do it. It's not like the old days when you needed lots of money to do a huge survey or you needed really good contacts to interview a politician. This kind of stuff you can do from your laptop at home. Um, but make sure you choose one of the degrees that combines political science and data science or social science and data science, because that's how you do the combination that I've emphasised is really important. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Robert. I believe the attendees found it very helpful. Now let's move to the Q&A session. I will pick a couple of questions from the chat box and ask the academics. So here's the first question. The central government led quarantine or local government led quarantine. What do you think would be more helpful um, in case preventing the disease. So, and she, she or he also gave us example of the US. So may I know uh, who would like to answer for this first? Maybe you can raise your hand so that I can nominate your name. May I ask to Dr. Dutta? Is that okay? Uh, sure. Uh, I, 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 so the UK is a very centralised um, government government system. Um, it's not federalised in the way that other countries like the US are. Um, the power of local government has been really diminished. So it, it's it's been uh, it's been difficult to have um, yeah any any kind of mode of lockdown that isn't coming from central government um, and because we've had a central government that's been quite reluctant to lock down a, a very quick very quickly that's often led to yeah some of the problems that we've had in in in, in this country but uh, i'm sure if any of the other two have have anything to add sure uh anyone like to add any other comments oh yes please robert dr robert um i mean 
I think that um, the, the Sahil is right. Um, and it's, it's really a kind of interaction of um, kind of state capacity with what would be ideal, as in, I think that local would probably work better than national if it's possible. But in a case where local government has been um, <clears throat> depleted or weakened in the way that was just described, um, that becomes an issue. There's also an important consideration is what you really want to know is where do people feel most strongly about? Because a level of kind of identity and trust turns out to be really important here. So if you have local government that really is like, for example, people really feel they belong to their city and they want to do right by their city, then that's the place to have doing these, these things because that's, that's who people will want to follow. Um, but if local government is just some kind of arbitrary piece of land that people don't feel any great connection to, then they're much less likely to do what, what it is asking them to do. And maybe national would work better in that context. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Uh, the next question is, how did the Brexit influence on responding COVID-19 in the UK, such as vaccination? So she'd like to hear from all of your opinions. So may I start with Dr. James? Are you ready? Yes, no, that's, that's right. So uh, clearly Brexit has impacted. I mean, one of the most obvious uh, factors is that, that Britain has developed its own system for procuring the vaccine separate from the uh, European Commission run system. And that has led to some um, disagreements perhaps around distribution of vaccine. I mean, I think if you look internationally, there is the, the issue of whether people are getting vaccines for their uh, national communities or uh, whether you know the, the extent to which vaccines should be exported. I mean I do think in terms of in terms of vaccine procurement the UK uh, moved very quickly to uh, procure large numbers of vaccines from, from multiple manufacturers and so I think that's reflected in the vaccine rollout uh, being uh, very uh, well relatively quick in the UK um, and indeed I think we have over sort of 20 well definitely over 20 million people have had their first vaccine. Of course, in terms of the solution for uh, this issue, uh, it's going to require international cooperation. And um, if you look now at the increase in cases in, um, uh, in, in continental Europe, clearly that would have implications for the UK in its own terms. But more generally, uh, the need will still remain for international coordination, both uh, with, between, between countries in, in the continent of Europe, but also internationally. So um, I, I think that um, is an important challenge for, for sort of, you know, international uh, coordination is, is, is to get governments to, to work collaboratively um, in, in the area of, of um, that, but also say, for example, in terms of movement of people internationally, uh, in, in, in terms of recognizing uh, testing uh, and status, COVID status of, of you know, travelers, but also uh, whether travelers been, have been vaccinated and that would be crucial. But I do think there are, is a lot of progress uh, being made in that. And so I am you know, quite quite hopeful in a way that um, mm -hmm. there can be uh, um, some solutions to this that will again allow international travel, for example, for student recruitment. I'm, I'm pretty confident that will be uh, that will be possible. Uh, and, and that's obviously important to, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to the sort of conversations we're having today. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Maybe we can uh, hear from another uh, one of one of either of uh, the other academics about this. Who would like to add uh, do? Who would like to answer to this question as well? Oh yes, Robert, uh, please. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, I mean, I agree um, with with what you've just heard. I, I think it. It came at an interesting time, uh, the pandemic, in terms of Britain's post-Brexit politics, because we were hugely polarised on this issue. Um, and in some ways, actually, um, the pandemic has created a bit more national um, unity in, in some respects. But the vaccine politics have certainly threatened to, to undermine that. Um, I want to answer the question in a slightly um, sideways manner, which is to say that I would say that some of the um, 
the factors that drove the Brexit vote were visible in especially the early dealing with the pandemic. And in particular, there was a clear assumption from Britain's government and it, and it was a, Brit, a British government that was elected and was formed largely of people who did not want to be in the European Union. And I think they had a, we will be fine, we're Britain, we're strong. This is the kind of thing that's happening in places like Italy, which are not as um, well governed and not as competent as we are. And that proved to be a, literally a fatal mistake. And I think that although thing, that there's no doubt that not being in the European Union has been an advantage in terms of vaccine procurement, um, I think that there is a danger that um, that kind of sense of slightly national overestimation of ourselves will be kind of encouraged in what will turn out to be an unhelpful way um, down the line. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. So I might need to take the last question considering our limited time. So the last question will be mm, much more simple, but could be complicated. So the question is, what are the benefits of studying sociology and education in the UK compared to the US? So who would like to answer to this question? It's a bit tricky. Yes, Dr. Delta, please. I can make a, a I wouldn't want to, you know, <laughs> decry any other place to study this. <laughs> there are, there are all great places to be studying. I think the tradition of sociology and of um, of a tradition of qualitative um, political inquiry in the in the UK is very strong. And so there is um, if you're interested in the questions of 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 power and of history and how these things play out in the kind of contemporary concerns we have. I think the UK has a strong basis for that. Um, but, you know, there's there's. It, it's as an educator, you don't want to speak badly of any other place to be educated. They're all good places to be. Um, the UK is a, is a great, it's a very exciting place to study at the moment um, because there's so much politics in the air right now, I would say. Yes, thank you very much, Tata. Oh, yes, please. Sorry, I, I would just add to that to say that I think, you know, part of um, the UK is, is a very international um, oriented uh, place to study, We're very open. We have a long tradition. Um, it, it, many of our institutions are welcoming people from South Korea to study. Many of them have gone back to South Korea and have uh, successful uh, careers both there and, and also working in international organizations as well. Uh, I mean, I, you know, superficially, you know, the time zone actually is it means that we, we are having this conversation today. Actually, if you're in the, you know, if you're on the east coast of the US, it's even further, further, further away. I mean, that's about the sort of you know, superficial difference. But I would say I would say, you know, just say the positive uh, aspects um, is we're saying around studying in the UK. I'd go and have a look at our websites and, and see what's um, uh, what, what's what's good for you. And, and, you know, there are great opportunities, as I said, you know, we're quite optimistic that um, COVID is being um, brought under control and that the restrictions, you know, we have students studying at, at UK institutions from Korea right now. You know, I was teaching students um, uh, are, are online this week. We, we, you know, we're planning to try to, to do some face-to-face um, -face teaching as soon as possible. Last term, I was teaching students face-to-face -face in the classroom from South Korea. So indeed, I think we can uh, not only manage this situation, but um, you know, successfully deal with it, um, you know, both in the UK and internationally. Thank you very much, James and Dr. Dota. So um, I think I need to wrap up this session, but I would like to thank to all the speakers for sharing your insightful and sharp opinions. And I hope and I believe the attendees will find it very useful and helpful. So uh, dear attendees, if you have any further inquiries to the professors and the universities, please feel free to directly contact to the university reps. You can find this information in the chat box too. I deeply appreciate all the academic speakers once again, and also the university reps for your wonderful support today. Dear attendees, why don't you send a thank you message in the chat box? Uh, we will pick a person from the chat box for our present and notify the winner by replying to the comment. So please check if you get the comment. 
and follow us on Kakao Talks so that we can keep you posted about upcoming events and latest news on studying in the UK. So everyone, thank you so much for joining our third session today. In 10 minutes, the fourth session will begin. Please feel free to join if you're interested. Well then, have a wonderful weekend and see you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.